And, uh, but tonight we're going to talk about <clears throat> walking with God. Let's, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to um, give the word. I do thank you, Father, that this word will find a home in each and every heart. And I thank you, Lord, that we honor your word. And we've, we've hid your word in our heart that we might not sin against you, Lord. And, and we've honored your word that it'll be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord. And, and we'll let the word correct us and, and shape us and mold us by the leading of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so we're, we are living in the last days. You can look out there and see um, what's happening in the world and what, what we've gone through with coronavirus. I mean, you have to be pretty um, lost in yourself or lost in the world not to see there's some pretty serious things happening out there. And, uh, you know, in these last days, as we stand on the Word of God, it will automatically make us stand out, which we should be standing out anyway. I was seeing watching in the news there and reading about it where um, Finland is, uh, is persecuting Christians. Did anybody see that? Finland. Uh, uh, there's a, uh, a statistic here. Less than a third of the, of the Finns say that they believe in God. And that was known as a Christian nation at one time. And so there's two people that are undergoing trial right now. I think they just, they just finished up. They faced two years in prison. And you know what their crime is, or was, according to them, teaching on traditional marriage and teaching on what sin is. You know, that's the same thing that got the Christians in trouble back in the, in, in the early days, basically, because the Romans helped spread the gospel. The very roads that the Romans built, um, the gospel went out on those roads, but, but they ran into a little bit of an issue because... The Romans were very accepting to every god. You know, you have a, I, I worship the god of the frog. Or this little pine cone is my god. Oh, yeah, come on in. We, we like gods. Then here comes Christianity. Okay, there's only one true god. And, there, and, and, and there's Jesus. And there's accountability. They didn't like that. They didn't like that at all. So the persecution started to come in and and... Sort of what's happening at a more rapid rate. You know, those leaders in Finland, they're good friends with our leaders, the ones that are in office now. They, a lot of those worldly leaders are all on the same page, which is a one world order or a reset. And Christianity isn't in their plans. But you know what? They're not going to move Christianity until Jesus says, come up hither. Right. And then there's an old saying that says, be careful what you ask for. You might get it because that's when the Antichrist and all those other terrible things are going to move in. But until then, my Bible tells me we're to occupy Amen. until he comes. There's a lot of stuff going on in these last days. And I don't read we have a lot of control over it. Uh, a lot of things happening. But I do know this. Jesus said that the gospel will be preached. Amen. We do have a part to play in that. Amen. Do we not? And so we're doing our part here at Freedom in Christ Church. We're preaching the gospel. And um, one of the, the charge that these two people in Finland are under, they called it ethnic agitation and defaming or insulting homosexuals. And so um, th that has happened in this country. They have sort of shifted and manipulated the Constitution and rules that um, someone's sexual preference, they've put it in a class of a, of a race, almost. So if, if you teach traditional marriage, they see it as coming against someone's race. It's not a race, it's a choice, right? And besides, what we teach in, our, in here should be up to us. We're not going out and bullying anybody or harassing anyone, but we're called to preach the truth. And so the woman, the one woman that's... Um, thrown in jail, she's, 60, she's a 62-year-old grandmother. And she got in trouble for Romans 1, 24 through 27. So let's read that in honor of her and see what, see what the devil didn't like about that, <laughs> right? I think hers was or either, it's a, it's a man and a woman, it was a tweet that one of them got in trouble for it. it might have just, I think they just tweeted this verse. 
Anyone want to compromise in here? I mean, I don't. Romans 1, 24 through 27. Here's what they got thrown in prison for. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served a creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vow affections, for even their women did change the natural use into, which, into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. And so that's what the word says. So I stand, I stand with them, amen? amen, because they stand on the word of God. Now, the Bible talks about a man by the name of Enoch. Enoch is known in the scripture as someone who walked with God, and he had a testimony that he pleased God. So I just want to look at his life a, l- a little bit. We know that Enoch was the great, great grandfather of Noah. Now, Enoch's son was Methuselah. Now, Methuselah was a prophetic name that God gave to Enoch for his son. Methuselah means when, when he is dead, it, it shall be sent. Or when he is dead, the judgment will come. And uh, the flood came. The same year that Methuselah died, God sent the flood. But the thing that I believe what the Holy Spirit wants us to, to get out of Methuselah's life, he lived to be 969 years of age. He was the oldest living human being that ever lived. And that speaks to God's mercy, doesn't it? It speaks to his long suffering. 969 years from the time that God said that, um, that when Methuselah was born, his name was to be when he is dead, the judgment will be sent. And the world didn't get any better. It just kept getting worse and worse. We're blessed that Noah and his family was, was able to hang in there, right? And to glorify God. So, Look at uh, Genesis 5, verse 23. We're going to read a little bit about Enoch and see uh, something great that happened to him. Enoch was a deep, deep spiritual man. I think out of all the Old Testament saints, I don't think you're going to find anybody more deep and more spiritual with more, a better relationship. I mean, there might be some that come up to that level, but he literally walked with God. He was on, a, on another level. You say, was that because he was special? No, it was because he desired it. He had the will for it. He diligently sought God, and, and if you seek God, you get God. And so Genesis 5, 23 It says, so all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And we know what that means when it says God took him, he was raptured. He just caught up into the heavens. And uh, um, we know that Elijah, Elijah also was caught up into the heavens, right? So sometimes people say they don't believe in the rapture. Well, there's two people. Enoch and Elijah were taken up alive. If God did it for two, he can do it for billions. What's it to God, right? But we know those two are probably going to be the ones that come back and all the witnesses there in Jerusalem. They have never died. And um, so they're up there in heaven in that way. They have a special assignment, do they not? And so um, Enoch is mentioned in the Hall of Fame of Faith in um, Hebrews chapter 11. Let's look at that. Many people call Hebrews 11 the Hall of Fame of Faith, and I like that name. A lot of people in there listed for their faith walk. I don't see a Hall of Fame for fear. <laughs> There's not that, right? And, and, uh, in fact, many times the Bible refers to fear as evil. Doubt and unbelief, evil report. I mean, I don't want to be hooked up with the evil report. 
I don't want to be like the nation of Israel that were influ influenced by the spies that came back and said, we can't get, get into the promised land. We're mere grasshoppers and there's no way. I don't want to be, I don't want to fall for an evil report. I want to be like Joshua and Caleb who said, no, nope, God said we can do it and the battle belongs to him. We want to believe the good report, right? Look at Hebrews 11:5. It says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. That's, all, that's, that's the ultimate goal, right? Look at verse 6. It says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. And so God wants you to know who he is. He doesn't just want you to know that he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and omnipresent, and has always existed. He wants you to know his character. He wants you to know that he, he, wants you to know that he is love. Amen. But in order to know who God is, you have to know who you are in his sight. In his sight, you are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In his sight, you have been washed and cleansed free, free from all sin. You, the old man is dead and you're walking in the newness of life. Right? That's how you can say your past doesn't define you. You're living for God. God has washed away all of your sins. And so for us, it means that we, we know what Jesus did for us. We were saying um, Sunday morning that the Bible says that we are a joint heir with Christ. That's a lot more than, than just being a Christian. I'm thankful being, for being a Christian. You know, Jesus introduced uh, the word born again. That, word, that, that phrase had never been said before. We're born again in the Spirit. Amen. The Bible says we become new creations. But Jesus said we're joint heirs with Christ. That's what the Word says. We're, we're right there with Him. Does the Bible say you're one spirit with the Lord? So sometimes, remember now we're talking about that, we're talking about that um, we have to believe who God is. We have to understand who God is in order to please him. We're not talking about his love for us. He loves us unconditionally, right? And, and, uh, but we have to understand that we are one spirit with the Lord. We are joint heirs with Christ. We have the name above all names. We are, all of us, are the body of Christ. If I, have to, if I correctly understand who God is and who I am in Christ, there's another part to that. I have to correctly understand who you are, too, Amen. and reverence you for, for being blood-brought brothers and sisters and joined with me by the Holy Ghost. We can't think that we're alone rangering it, right? And we're out there doing our own thing. But so we're one spirit with the Lord. We've been brought near by the blood of, of Christ. So sometimes... We have to be careful. Now, sometimes we have some songs that sort of head that way, but it's okay because if you get the spirit of it, always draw near to God. But know this, God's never the problem. You don't have to wait until you're one with him. You're already one with God. But maybe your heart needs to catch up with that. Maybe your understanding, but it's important. God has withheld no good thing from you. Are you already a citizen of heaven? Amen. Is your name already written down in the Lamb's book of life? Amen. Did Jesus say in my name you can already cast out devils and lay hands on the sick and they'll recover? Amen. I mean, you, you haven't, he hasn't withheld anything. And so when you pray or when you sing, understand that fact that, that God is already accepting you. God has already come near to you. Now you must come near to him. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, wait till God comes near you. It says you draw near to him. The, the way has been paved, right? And so that all comes into part of knowing who he is. I know who God is. I know that he loves me unconditionally. Amen. Ever since mom and dad started this church, I have never, ever once not understood that God loved me unconditionally. And I have always known to go to God where I would find help in my time of need. 
That's, that's helped me along the way. Because sometimes we don't feel like we're much of a Christian or we don't feel like we're, we're hot stuff so much. Am I the only one? You know? <laughs> and, uh, boy, if you just go to God and let him, let him minister to you, it works out. So verse 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please God, for he who comes to God... See how it says you got to come to God? Got to press into God? Why? There's no barriers. There's no limitation. Wide open. Jesus, your high priest, the one that you are one spirit with, the one that you are joint heir with, is right there at the throne room of God. God the Son sitting at the right hand hand of Christ and guess what you were seated with him there we are seated with him there in in heavenly places it says in the book of Ephesians we're there with him yeah we're on the earth right now finishing our journey and completing our mission but but technically we're with Christ we're in Christ that's why we glorify him that's why Paul said it's not I that lives but Christ that lives in me Remember when Saul was persecuting the church? Jesus came on the scene and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting thou me? Amen. You persecute the church, you're persecuting Christ. Jesus said, if they hated him without cause, they're going to hate you too for his sake. That's okay. I'd rather be on a limb with Jesus Christ than standing on solid ground with the devil. Amen. Amen. And so we got to believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder to those who diligently seek him. You know, you're not going to diligently seek God if you don't know who he is. If you think you're run, you have to run from him. Uh, one thing that, that bothers us here, and we try to correct that, and it happens a lot, though, is sometimes people get this mindset that they're second-class Christians. There's no second-class Christians. We're all first-class. All first-class. And, and, and we are just responsible to do what God called us to do, not what someone else is doing. If you're doing what God called you, you to do, you're just as ex- successful as anybody else. Amen. Amen. I've said this many times. You can have a guy like Billy Graham. He had a wonderful ministry, did he not? Yeah. But you know what? He was doing what God called him to do. And he wasn't doing it in his own strength, and his own might. It wasn't Jesus A and Jesus B, whatever. No, it was Jesus, his strength, his wisdom. And and but he did what God told him to do. And Billy Graham said one time, he said that he wasn't God's first choice. The guy that God went to first turned him down. Turned God down. But I say this to you, because remember, we got to know that God is. Got to know everything about God. Got to know how he sees us and know how how we are to honor him. If you have someone that teaches Sunday school, say for 30, 40 years, and that's what God called them to them to do in their her to say it's a woman in her local church. Billy Graham will get no more rewards in heaven than that woman. Do you believe that? She's doing what God called her to do here. Why would this church be any less than any other ministry? Why would the people that come in here be any less important and, and any less um, precious than, than any other ministry? That's why when you walk in churches, you have to respect them because they're holy ground. And you can have a church of 10 people that have the power of the Holy Spirit in, and they're sanctified and they're called by God. And you can have a church of 3,000 that don't have the Spirit of God in them and never has. So stop looking at the numbers. Start looking at the at the call and the people and what God's called us to do. Now, we, we are called to trust people. God trusts, trusts people to get the gospel out, right? We, he uses imperfect vessels. And so we, we have to trust that God can work in people just like he works in us to do the, the ministry as well. And if we see him make a mistake or we see him falter, well, we can pray for him and lift him up, right? Because you probably needed that at one time, too. But we have to learn to trust that God is moving, living, moving, and breathing in, in people other than ourselves. And so we know that Enoch walked with God, 
in a wicked time right before the flood. Probably, probably the most wicked time on the earth. But right now, sin is ramping up that it's, it's getting to about, to be, about to that point. Obviously, at the end time, sin's going to get more corrupt and wicked. But it doesn't mean that the light of the gospel is dimmed. Does it? Does it mean that the power of the Holy Spirit is, is, sub, is sub inferior to the darkness of deception? No way. No how. So as they get darker, we get brighter. We, whatever we need to do, we'll be for the kingdom of God, right? Amen. But most of the world didn't walk with God. They walked their own path, their crooked way of sin. In fact, Jesus compares the last days and the time of his coming to the time of Noah. He makes a direct comparison, the time that we're living in to the time of Noah. Let's look at that, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I think there's a lot of Christians, you gotta be careful we don't get caught up, oh, look how terrible the world's getting. You know, okay, I guess it's, it's getting pretty bad in some places. But look how bright the kingdom of God is getting. The kingdom of God has always been bright, but, but when people walk in it and believe in it, persecution spreads the church, right? People are, let me put it this way, people are walking in more degrees of God's glory because, because they're just, their eyes are being opened and they're, they're seeking God with the diligence. I believe that most Christians are walking about in one-tenth of the power that, and the glory that they could walk in. In this country, anyway, because they're too comfortable. Right? Matthew 24, 36. It says, But of that day and hour no one knows. Jesus said this, Not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only when he comes. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. This gives us a little bit of insight that the world would be pretty comfortable in their sin. And they'll be eating, drinking and marrying and, and then um, they'll, be, they'll be swept away um, by the end times events that and not even really see it coming but let's look at genesis 6 5 and it, it describes the days of noah because remember jesus said our time will be like the time of noah as far as the wickedness and the sinfulness of the world what finland is doing to those two christians over there that's that's pretty much that's pretty bad Amen. Less than a third of, of Finns believe in God. Less than a third. And now what are you going to do? You know what it's going to take? Some brave missionaries and some brave churches over there to keep preaching the word. That's what I would do. These people are facing two years in jail. Let's pray that they don't get that. But the time that the church was persecuted the most is the time that it spread the fastest also. Right? You say, well, th we're, we're living in this country. That can't happen in here. Well, I, I think it could happen. That's why we got to pray. You know, the, if it weren't for those two Democrat senators holding out, Manchin and, and the other one, Cinema, what, right? the Democrats would have already changed the whole landscape of the United States of America. Thankfully, you got two people that have a conscience, right? I mean, we're right there, right on the line. And these midterms coming up are, are big deals, right? And so look at Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's pretty bad. All the people in the earth, all they thought about was evil. Right? Look at verse 11. 
the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. See how the sin and the corruption, what comes with that violence? Look what we have in our own country today. These, these district attorneys that don't uh, prosecute crimes. Lawlessness. And look at verse 12. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. For all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. Now how many believe that when God judged the earth and he flooded the earth... How many believe that it was a judge, it was a, uh, a righteous judgment? Of course it was, because God's righteous, right? He's not unrighteous. And so, but in the, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew reads this verse like this. The earth also had become corrupt, which is saying it didn't start off corrupt, but it became progressively corrupt more and more corrupt as, as it went on, right? That's the nature of sin, right? Someone says, well, this abortion is getting out of hand. When's it ever going to stop? It won't stop. It'll keep, it'll keep getting more and more gross and more and more violent and more and more sick because sin doesn't just stop and say, I've had enough. It went from first trimester to second trimester to third trimester. Now you have the, the, the old one governor of Virginia saying, well, with the baby's born, the mother and the doctor will decide if it lives. A human being. When's it, what, what's the stopping point? There is none. Sin will not stop until it totally consumes. And the only thing that can stop it is the truth of God's word and the power of God. If we compromise, how will that lost and dying world ever see the light? We're not called to just hide out in our living rooms and, and just wait it out. God needs us to be a light, to be the city on the hill, to speak the truth in love. He needs me or Pastor Dane or my dad, when we're standing up here, to say what the Holy Spirit puts in our heart. To speak the word of God, speak the truth in love because people need to hear it. Doesn't need me up here hiding out behind a, a politically correct sermon. Right. Amen. Because I know that the Holy Spirit is being poured out in an abundant measure, and we're ready. Right? We're ready to walk in that glory. We're ready to walk in the Shekinah glory. The presence of God that just just rolls in amen rolls in and rolls on top of all of us so the actual verbiage is had become corrupt before god and the earth was filled with violence so god looked upon the earth and indeed it had become it's a kumosh that's the actual old hebrew word kumosh had become corrupt for all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth and so there is a progression to sin. That word had become, it, 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 there's a lot of meaning to it. Here's the progression of sin, and you tell me if this isn't 100% how it happens. First, sin is done in private. Then sin becomes a habit. You know, you can form habits that aren't good. You should keep your flesh from, from trying to form habits. And I, I'm preaching to myself now because, you know, sometimes you like certain foods, and I do certain foods and things, and like, Eat one one time and you want one the next day. You know, I remember her brother Hagen talking about he used to walk by this old country store. He went in there and got a, a Pepsi one day and, uh, or Coca-Cola. And then the next day he went in there and got, got a Coca-Cola. And then, then the next day he walked by, his flesh was like, and he saw it. He said, no, nope, I see what you're doing, flesh. You want to form a habit in me. And he had, to knock, he had to knock it out. But nothing against Coca-Cola, I'm just saying. <laughs> you work out your own salvation. But, but sin becomes a habit, right? And then what happens? People lose the shame of sinning. There's no shame, right? Then the fourth stage and the final stage. The behavior of sin becomes accepted, even required normal behavior. 
That's so good, I'm going to read it again. The behavior of sin becomes accepted, even the required normal behavior. The, ba- the, the, the um, behavior of sin according to the Word of God. The Word of God tells you what is sin and what isn't, right? What is right and what's wrong. What glorifies God and what, what doesn't glorify Him. So that, that old saying for sin is, is the same today as it was yesterday. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay, right? So what's really going to deceive people in the last days won't appear as blatant evil. It's going to be a form of good that is blatantly evil in God's eyes. Let me say that again. What's really going to deceive people in the last days won't appear as blatant evil. It's going to be a form of good or something that the world calls good, but it's blatantly evil in God's eyes. That's how the world's getting deceived today, right? Little little Finland putting out such a big charge against Christianity. You know, some years ago, there was a, a mayor, it was a woman in one of these Texas towns. She got on her high horse, and, and she, she wanted to get the sermon notes of every pastor in the town. What she want the sermon notes for? She wanted to go through there and see if they're teaching against homosexuality, because that's a crime in her eyes. That's exactly what she wanted to do. This isn't the same people in government that were when we were younger, right? It's not the same Democratic Party. It's the devil got in there. I I know there's some Republicans that that aren't very good either, but by and large, it's the devil working through those people and and, um, pulling people away from God, taking Bibles out of schools, and doing all that they're doing. Thank God for freedom of religion, right? So, look at Jude chapter 1, verse 14. Enoch has a uh, prophecy here. Remember now, Enoch lived a long time ago. But here he is prophesying something that's going to happen thousands of years later. When you walk with God, you're going to know things. Who was it that, who, who was it, Simeon? Simeon, he, he, um, he, the Lord promised that he wouldn't die before he would see the Christ in the temple. Jesus and Joseph and Mary walked around a lot of people Walked past them with Jesus. None of them saw anything. None didn't know anything. Simeon knew. So what I'm saying is, you hook up with God and you keep pressing into him. The Holy Spirit will tell you things that are going to come. He'll give you peace and comfort. You don't have to be afraid. Right? I mean, what what are we going to do? What are pastors going to do? They're going to come up behind a pulpit with fear in their heart? I remember God telling Jeremiah, he said, don't be afraid of their faces. He said, you go out there and tell them what I told you to tell them, and I'm going to take care of you. Yeah, he got thrown in a pit, (laughs) and he wasn't too happy about that, but he made out all right. You follow his story, that that country didn't. They they had their chance that they would have listened to him. And so, you know, what happened with Peter and John when they were going into the temple and, and they said, gold and silver have I none, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. That was a big to-do, right? The Pharisees weren't happy about it. The religious people. Can you imagine someone not being happy about a, a crippled man walking? That's pretty bad. And they threatened them. They threatened them. And what did they say? Even they figured out where all the power came from. Here, here was their, their threatening words. Do not preach 
or even speak or say anything about that name Jesus. And Peter's like, well, no can do. I'll paraphrase him. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor my God. Right? But what did they do? What did they do in the book of Acts whenever they were threatened and they were undergoing um, persecution and bondage and whenever they were able to? They went and assembled with their own kind and they prayed for strength. You know what? We need to pray for ministers. We need to pray for strength and courage. Because that's what it's going to take. I try to like always be respectful and, and make a distinction. I'm not, I'm speaking to, to the flock that God has, has chosen, asked me to speak to. I'm giving you instructions. The world, they can do what they want to do. They can heed this or not. They, God gave them a free will. But we have to speak the word, we have to speak the truth. Even when it comes to homosexuality. There was a woman one time, she was sitting in the back of the church, and she, she was full-blown in, into that lifestyle, and we didn't know it. We were just preaching as the Holy Spirit led, and she came up and got saved. Filled with the Holy Spirit and delivered from alcoholism. The trifecta. And she said, you know, I went to counselors, and they all told me it was okay. It's okay. According to God, it's not okay. Yeah. Right? It's, it's sinful, and we're to, we're to be free of that. And she said that I went to church when I was a young girl, and my parents took me to church, and, I, and every time they told me that it was okay, inside here, inside here, I just felt something in me, like, man, I don't know. I don't know. I know they're telling me it's okay, but I just don't feel right. All she needed to do, it could have been any church that speaks, speaks the truth. All she needed to do is hear the truth under the anointing. That's all she needed to help her. Any kind of like, the, 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 the sexual intimacy is between a man and a woman in the marriage bed. It's the only bed that's undefiled according to the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. I was working with another person one time that was born again, but they were struggling with that, with the homosexuality. And they said, uh, they said I'm, just, um, I'm just a homosexual. I said, don't say that. Because the Bible says no homosexuals will make it into heaven. I said, you know who you are? You're a born again believer who has been delivered but you still struggle with it just in the flesh, but that's not who you are. You're washed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? If you keep blurring the lines of sin, there, there'll be no repentance. The people won't know how, how to turn, which way to go. You have to tell them the truth. And some churches are really good at telling the truth, and, and sometimes I think Word of Faith churches have laughed at them, and you know what? There's a place for telling people the just cold, hard truth about sin. So if I do that, don't worry. We know how to grow people up spiritually. But they need to know the truth. You know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? Look at Jude 1.14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, here's what Enoch prophesied. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. He's talking about the second coming of Christ, right? <coughs> After the battle of Armageddon. Look at verse 15, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed, and of their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so this is the second coming, as I said. Do you know we're in that number? Let's read it again in verse 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands. See the S? Not ten thousand. Ten thousands. There are some religions that say, We're the ten thousand. Oh, really? 
you better go back and see that there's an S there. And the reason it was 10,000, the reason the Bible records 10,000 is this. It's very simple. They didn't know words like 100,000 or a million or a billion or a trillion. So when they said 10,000, they were talking about a big number. Right? And in fact, I'll even show you. The Amplified Bible says, look, the Lord came with myriads of his holy ones. Myriad is a countless or extremely great number. So what Enoch saw was a countless or extremely great number of saints coming back with Jesus for the righteous rule. Amen. Amen. You will be in that number. You're coming back with the Lord. Don't get tied up with the lost and dying world. Don't get caught up in the perversion of the world and all that they're, they're trying to pervert. Everything that's holy be, before God, they're trying to pervert. No, let's keep things, what's holy, holy. And you know what else is holy? Your gender. Because God made every human being, male or female, he created them. Right? Look at Titus chapter 2, verse 11. So we're talking about walking with God in a lost and dying world. That's why we got to assemble ourselves together, right? That's why we got to keep coming and keep lifting each other up and keep answering the call and keep pushing forward. I had an, I mean, I know the Lord called us to build that building. I know for sure, but I was surprised when he said about the school, but, but it makes sense to me looking back. Why wouldn't we want to be more involved in the, the life of the children? Because every time the, these governments that aren't godly, they always attack the children. Always. They always try to manipulate and indoctrinate. And it's not, they're, not, they're not satisfied now with just college level not just high school level. Now they want grade school. That's why if children, if children are going to make it through in this world we live in today, it's going to take the parent and the church together. That's the way it should have always been. Look at Titus 2.11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Listen to what the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're to live like that. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4:16. This is where it talks about the rapture. Because it says we're to look for that blessed hope, right? The glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's read about it. Let's read about this day that's coming soon. How many believe that Jesus is coming soon? First Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel. Let me just stop there. You know, that's going to send shivers up Satan's spine Amen. when he hears that, right? And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's the resurrection of the righteous. Those people that have died before us that put their faith in Jesus Christ, their bodies are coming up out of the earth from which it was created, right? 
I don't care what state the body's in, God's bringing it back. He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. He can form them body, those bodies out of the dust of the earth again because they're dust. A lot of them, right? But God's bringing them back. You know why? They belong to him always. Your body belongs to God. The Bible says, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which was purchased by him. He owns the body. God doesn't throw anything away except for your sins, right? But look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be what? Caught up. Now we know that word caught up in, in the, uh, in the uh, Latin Bible, in the Latin Vulgate Bible is the word rapier or rapapure, rapapure, which where we get the word rapture from. So if someone says to you the word rapture is not in the Bible, yes it is. You've got to take them to that word. And then tell them to do the research. Right? It's not hard. You could do it with a Google search. And you can see where the word comes from, right? So we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day that's going to be. Amen. Look at verse 18. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Well, a lot of places, a lot of churches, if you talk about the rapture, they don't even believe in it. Well, how are they going to ever get comforted? Paul said, comfort one another that Jesus is coming back. It's the rapture of the church. I keep trying to remind myself to always say that. It's not enough just to say the rapture. It's the rapture of the church. It's the resurrection of the righteous. It's, oh, happy day. A big reunion in the sky. You're going to fly. Make sure you get it right with people that, that you have a problem with, because what if you're flying up right next to them? Be like, you better get it right before you get up to the top. <laughs> right? I always say you don't have to apologize if you didn't do anything wrong, but you can apologize for just how things went down. Right? Got to guard your heart, and no one else can do that for you. So when it says that we'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, that word air in the Hebrew literally means the space between the ground and the mountaintop. That's what that word means. Or I'm not, the, not the Hebrew, but the Greek. The space between the ground and the highest mountain. What's the highest mountain? I don't know. Mount Everest? Okay. Sounds good to me. The, the air between that. Jesus is going to be in that space. We're going to be caught up together with them. So if you have any loved ones that have gone on before you, it's just a temporary separation. And we're going to be all together. Right? Clothed in white. 1 Corinthians 15 says that there's a changing going on, though. From corruption to incorruption. From mortality to immortality, you'll get your glorified body just like Jesus has. Now, one of the Bible says, no matter what we experience down here on this earth, no matter what hardship we face, it can't even be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed in us. The Bible says in Romans 8, all of creation is moaning and groaning right now, waiting for that day. All the spiritual world is moaning and groaning and stirring and wrestling around because they know he's coming soon. And I want to be found faithful. You got to love the sinner, but hate the sin. Amen. Because people are counting on us. 
They're counting on me. They're counting on you to, tell, to, to represent Christ and, and to speak the truth in love. Because if we don't, who will? I think every morning we should wake up and say, Lord, lay some soul upon my heart. And win that some soul through me. Why, aren't we, why can't we be more soul-minded? We can. So we've got to win these souls. It's not hard. Sometimes we look at the media and, and the things of the world as portrayed as all this big, bad stuff. No, there's hurting and lost people out there. They just need to hear something of truth. They just need to hear it. If they don't hear, the Bible says, how will they know? If, if, if someone isn't sent and they don't speak, that's why the feet of those who spread the gospel are precious, the Bible says. That's what we're called to do. You get up in the morning and you pray and you spend time with the Lord. But you must understand that the heartbeat of God is in the salvation of souls. That's what makes his heart beat. Picture if you, just imagine it, not, I'm not going like, to confess that, but say someone had a child that was missing and they didn't know where they were at. And they would pray and pray, God, help, send somebody along to help them and, and to minister to them and get them on the right track and keep them safe. Well, that's what God's praying every day. That his people would stop arguing with each other and wake up and start, stop getting in these pity arguments because that's what the devil does. He gets us caught up in these little things, these little th be soul-minded. What's that one song Ray Bolt sings? Thank you. Thank you for um, giving to the Lord. Thank you for, I was a soul that was lost. And, and you know, how many people are you going to have in heaven that's going to come up to you and say, thank you, you were the one. We've picked up quite a few people to watch his own Facebook, and some of those people have died that I didn't even know about, but they, they were enjoying the messages, and they were hearing the messages. I believe a lot of them got some good word that they weren't saved before. They had a good opportunity to get saved. Burning up too much energy in, in useless fights. You let God fight your battles and you go out there and win some for the kingdom of God. And, that, and, and, and uh, you'll be just fine. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Let you out seven minutes early. I still preach a long time now. Don't expect that every Wednesday. No, I'm just kidding. But honestly, I, I do thank you for coming out in the middle of the week because I know sometimes in the middle of the week it's tougher. But I, I enjoy seeing you here. And it, you know, thank you for believing in the call of the, of the ministry. But also, when we start getting people wandering in and stuff, it's nice to have you here too, right? And, and um, so thank you for that. Thank you for believing in the church and what God called us to do. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and uh, I thank you, Lord, for this moment that we had to um, just uh, hear your word. I thank you, Lord God, that we'll continue on and, and not compromise, but we'll speak the truth in love, and we'll be strong, and we'll be faithful. So, Lord, I thank you for being with each and every person here as they go home. I thank you, Lord, for keeping them safe and health, healthy and happy. And also, Lord, I thank you for watching over their children, too. Thank you, Father God, that, that you're, you said that, Father God, that our children are your children. And you would bless our, our generations to come. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.